Um, good afternoon, good afternoon. colleagues and learners. Um, I would like to tell you about the biological control of invasive alien plants in South Africa. OK, let me just get this going. OK, first of all, I'd like to give you an overview of the um, ARC weed biocontrol program. Uh, the, my research division at uh, Ruder plant here undertakes research on the biocontrol of invasive alien plants, which we know as weeds, uh, to reduce the impact of alien invasive plants on biodiversity, ecosystem function, and the negative impacts that weeds have on natural resources such as water and rangeland. Uh, the development of uh, management strategies for our IAPs utilizing biocontrol, uh, we do this because it's a cost effective and environmentally sustainable alternative to herbicide application and mechanical clearance. First of all, I'd like to tell you about the source of our invasive alien plants. Well, these are, these are um, found overseas and mainly in our current uh, crop of um, plants come from Central America, South America, Australia and India. Uh, they can be uh, basically there can be planned introductions that have gone wrong. For instance, people with their good intentions brought in Australian acacias for stabilizing the sand dunes on the Cape Flats. Wattles were brought in for the agroforestry industry. Prosopis trees were brought in for shade and fodder in the Karoo. And even the jacarandas in Pretoria that were brought in for shade, and then they've become a problem in the last few years. And then there's accidental introductions, which are, for instance, uh, a lot of grassland weeds were brought in with horse fodder um, for the for horses, for the British horses during the Anglo Boer War. Uh, water plants, well, this is a big problem. They're brought in for home fish aquariums, and uh, people then just throw the contents of the aquarium into the local stream, and then water plants escape and establish. And then we have a lot of uh, escaped ornamental plants from home gardens and nurseries. This is a major issue. Um, when plants are introduced into a new country without their natural enemies, they may become invasive. Here we have natural range of cactus in, in, in southern USA. And with the natural enemies keeping the biodiversity in check, keeping the cactus in check, when it comes into South Africa, we've left the enemies behind at home, and then they become wild and out of control. The impact of invasions of our invasive alien plants. Major impact is the loss of our native biodiversity. We all know that South Africa is unique biodiversity, I think it's second in the world in the in the um, biodiversity index, and we're losing a lot of that due to invasions. Um, invasive plants use a lot of our water. We're a very arid country, and we can't afford to lose our water. Um, they reduce access to water sources. Um, we can't get at the rivers and lakes that we've got because of they're clogged with with uh, invasive weeds, water weeds. They invade our farmland and cause loss of agricultural production. Um, with the increase of biomass in the habitats because of invasive alien plants, and a lot of them have high resin contents, we have an increased fire risk and uh, subsequent erosion after the fires. Then there's a loss of tourism potential. People want to come and see our Fainbos. They want to come to the, the parks and see things. They don't want to see weeds. At the moment, we've got over 2,000 exotic species of invasive alien plants in South Africa. Approximately 400 of these species are prohibited and regulated under our Environmental Protection Act, the NEMBA. The cost to taxpayers each year, well, we've got over 80,000 kilometers squared in South Africa are considered to be infested with some weeds or others. They estimated, it's estimated that they use over 3.3 billion cubic meters of water, which is about 8 to 10 percent of our entire runoff, not including the huge losses to our groundwater resources. The risk to biodiversity. Here's a photo of pom-pom weed invading natural grasslands on the high felt. 
The pom-pom comes in and outcompetes the native grasses and leads to a loss of diversity of the grasses and a whole collapse of the grassland ecosystem, causing a loss to our biodiversity. It's massive. Invasive hackias and, and Australian acacias are actually driving our fame boss areas to extinction in the Western Cape. We have plenty of other examples of invasive lantanas and, and chromolinas outcompeting and smothering our inv indigenous biodiversity. A number of the more serious um, invasive alien plants are what we call ecosystem transformers. They change the entire habitat. Here we've got uh, Prosopis, uh, mosquitoes it's called, invading drainage systems in the Northern Cape province, completely smothering the indigenous uh, vegetation and, and killing off the, the, the local biodiversity, changing the habitat for good. Um, a lot of invasive plants are a risk to water courses, wattles, cisbanias, Spanish reeds, we've got a whole list of things. They clog the, the, the streams, the rivers and the dams. When it does flood, then the floods are uncontrollable because the water can't rush away. So they, they cause increased sedimentation. They destroy the entire ecosystem of, of the, the catchment areas. The things like the water weeds, things like water hyacinths, we've seen these photos plenty of times before, completely clogging our rivers and dams and, and changing the habitat completely, destroying local biodiversity and, and uh, just impacting on everything. Now, water lettuce, another water weed. You know, the, when we've got a dam like this, the animals can't get down to drink. Nobody can go canoeing. Nobody can go sailing or boating. You can't fish. It clogs up the, the extraction um, equipment for water. It just ruins the whole um, you know, access to water is, is severely restricted. Impact of IAPs on agriculture. Well, once the, some of these weeds get into the farmland, it costs more to, re, to remove them than, than the, the farmland is worth. And, and the, the seeds and the, the, the prickly, for instance, Sartan's boss gets into the, the grain and into the crop and, and uh, it's, it's a nightmare. A lot of our um, basic weeds also have um, prickly um, parts to them and then they get the animals get injured, it gets stuck into the wool of the sheep, it reduces the value of the wool, animals lose condition, uh, very important aspects, the impact on animal health. Um, they destroy grazing, as I've said, destroy the grazing capacity and some are poisonous to humans and livestock. Uh, Parthenium weed is, is a serious allergenic weed which is a big problem in, in KwaZulu-Natal and all the way through to East Africa. Driving farmers off the land, it's, it's outcompeting the local grasses and reducing the grazing uh, prospects, but also the, the local people get severe allergies and they can't work anymore, driving people off the land. Prickly pear, cactus, various cacti, reducing the availability, availability of grazing in the, in the drier areas. Lantana invades a vast area and just out competes the, the, the rangeland and eventually the farmer just gives up. As I mentioned, a lot of the weeds increase the biomass in our native um, biodiversity, native habitats. The Australian acacias, for instance, full of resins, when a fire does come, it's so fierce. And so you know, we've seen these fires in the, in the Western Cape, the Southern Cape recently. When the fires do come, it it, it's far too hot for the native biodiversity. So we get the scorched earth policy. And then when it does rain, you get severe erosion. Loss of tourism. You might think, well, let's go to the to various parks and, and natural areas and you, you see you see green vegetation. But is it our indigenous stuff? You know, is it our indigenous plants? Well, here's one park full of chromolina. So the tourists are driving around looking at chromolina. Um, here people want to go and see the fame boss and it's full of hackia. So eventually this will lead to a degrading of our tourism potential in, in our special areas. Now we've got to talk about the biocontrol of uh, invasive alien plants. This is the use of host specific insects, mites or pathogens from the weeds country of origin to reduce invasive uh, potential of the IOPs and make it easier and more cost effective to control. Now, biocontrol does not eradicate 
the targets. We're not talking about complete dis, um, limiting, uh, destroying it completely, but it reduces the density to below economic and environmental damage levels. There's a balance then. The weed, if it gets out of hand, the biocontrol agents control it. When, when there's too little weed in the, in the environment and biocontrol agents then die off a bit and then the weed can come up again. So it's a cycle, but it's kept under below a target level. Benefits of biocontrol is host specific. This is the beauty of it. There's no damage to non-target species. Target plants are killed gradually. They can shelter the indigenous seedlings and there's no disturbance to habitats, no erosion, or much reduced erosion. The agents are mobile. They actively disperse and can search for their own hosts. Some are quicker than others. Some can disperse hundreds of kilometers in a year or two. Others take decades to just go a few kilometers because they only have a two year life cycle. So, um, it, but they do eventually they'll find the, their host themselves. It's sustainable, it's self perpetuating, perpetuating and it's permanent and it's cost effective. I just want to tell you about the process of how we evaluate agents. First of all, if we have a target weed, we would send our entomologists, our, our researchers and, and skilled technicians overseas to look for the target weed and to search for the agents on the plants in their natural habitat. These can be mites, insects, pathogens, whatever. They look for something that, that looks very promising and we have to import it into quarantine under permits. We have to, export permits and import permits that comes into a registered quarantine facility. Here we, we then have to do host testing. This can take years. We've got to work out what plants it, it does it only feed and damage its target plant, its target weed. Uh, does it uh, does it eat sunflowers? Does it eat cabbage? Does it eat other acacias? We've got to we've got to work that out and it can take years, up to seven years to, to do all the tests sometimes dozens, sometimes over a hundred test plants. Eventually, if we can prove that it's it's specific, we get we apply for release to the Department of Ag Agriculture and it's peer reviewed all over the world, these, these reports, and we get a release permit. Uh, then we release, then a lot more work starts. Then we've got to monitor the releases, see what the impact is. Some things that do very well in a cage like this do not do well out in the open. We, we've got to find out why. Is it the ants, predatory, uh, predatory ants, is it the, the humidity, is it the dry winters? We, we've got to find that out. So there's a lot of work to do. At ARC, we have magnificent quarantine facilities. Here's the quarantine facility at uh, ARC Ruderplatt. Uh, here we, we use evaporative cooling to save electricity. The, 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 air, the air comes in, is cooled by uh, water uh, um, through here and then it's uh, pumped out here. So we don't have to have cooling and heating machines, we just use the evaporative cooling, far more environmentally um, sustainable. Here we have the ARC Weeds Nursery, which is we actually grow the test plants. We have uh, all the roof can come back here and the doors can open and it's, it's irrigation there, magnificent facility. And um, here we have test plants being reared, different types of plants which the researchers then will wheel into the into the uh, quarantine facility and and see if their insects will feed on them. We, I just want to uh, quickly highlight the track record of weed biocontrol in South Africa over the past hundred years. Yes, we've we've been doing this for since 1913 when when uh, a cochineal insect was first released released on on drooping cactus in uh, in the in KZN. Um, we brought quite a few plants under complete control. Uh, we've released over 100, 116 species and we've been putting our foot on the gas a bit. In the last decade, we've released 30 new agents. Ah, these are what people like to see, the before and after shots. This is prickly pear in the, in the um, Karoo in the 1930s. Then we bring in a cochineal and cactus moth and we get the cleared sites. So a prickly pear, uh, which was um, drooping prickly pear that was that was covering a hat well tens of thousands and thousands of, of hectares was now reduced to to below economic problem status. Another cactus getting out of hand up in up in Limpopo, bring in a cochineal and we get dead cactus. We have queen of the night cactus, bring in stem boring beetle and some mealybugs. We have 
dead queen of the night cactus. So it, this is, these are the silver bullets. This is where biocontrol is really in action. Red water fern, um, bring in a, a frond feeding weevil and red water fern is, is under now biolog sustainable biological control. Suspania, uh, Suspania was in a big problem. Brought in a flower bud feeder, but that was OK, worked a little bit. Then we had to look for another agent, brought in a seed feeder and eventually we had to bring in a stem borer. And eventually we have dead Suspania. So it can be that often we need a whole suite of agents, it's not just one, it's not just a silver bullet. Often it's a buildup of pathogens and seed feeders and leaf feeders and stem borers and eventually we get the target. So biocontrol is seldom a solution on its own and often we or usually we have to combine it with appropriate chemical and mechanical control re resulting in what we call integrated control of weeds. Water hyacinths is, is an example. We've brought in a whole suite of biocontrol agents over the last 20, 30 years. And, and in certain circumstances, they work very well. They, they, they eat the fronds and, and kill it off, but, but water hyacinths is still a problem. And so we have to also rely on mechanical control to help us, chemical control, spraying of herbicides when it does get out of hand and the agents aren't working as best they should, and water quality is critical as well for water weeds. My conclusions are then that biocontrol is environmentally sustainable and cost effective. It's, it has a beneficial impact for our local biodiversity and protection of our natural resources. It makes it far easier for other uh, to use other control methods, far more cost effective, because uh, it helps us when there's not the mass of, of trees or things to clear and then the control teams can get in and clear the, the less dense vegetation. So biocontrol should form a compo component of all our integrated weed management plans. For capacity building, well, for learners out there, to get into biocontrol, we need entomologists, we need botanists, we need plant pathologists, we need people with GIS experience uh, at BTEC level and then, then at degree level. And uh, then the, you know, to become a specific researcher on a weed, then you'd have to probably get your doctorate. But there's a whole career path in biocontrol and I'm sure over the next decade, two decades, biocontrol has proven its worth and it has to be the centre of our weed management plans. Thank you. I'd like to a uh, couple of acknowledgements. First of all, to the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment, their natural resource management programmes. They've been supporting the ARC Weeds Biocontrol program since the days of the Working for Water about 25 years ago and they're very generous funding. Thank you very much to the ARC for the co-funding we received and also for the provision of the world class facilities that I've shown you. Uh, we have partnerships with a lot of with colleagues and, and research partners at, at other universities across the country, Rhodes, WITS, UCT, UKZN and many others. So it's a, it's a group effort. And finally, I'd like to thank the organisers for the National Science Week. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, 